it's Mike with UTAS from here at GoToConf 2014. I'm sitting here with Russ Olson. He's the author of Eloquent Ruby, and he's also presenting and, uh, on programming in interesting times here at GoToConf 2014. Thank you very much for taking the sure. time to speak. So programming in interesting times, what's so interesting about our times? So I think that, that the times are interesting because I think we go through these periods where programming languages are very stable. Mm -hmm. You know, 10 years ago there was Java and maybe C Sharp and most people were picking one of those right. or one of a very small menu of programming languages. And I think that every now and then those, you know, the major programming languages start to decline. They get towards the end mm -hmm. of their life cycle. And what happens is that you get this period of kind of flux right. where it's not clear which programming language you should you should use or which programming language you should you know be keeping an eye on. Yeah. There's not an obvious default, and yeah. I think we are definitely in one of those periods of interesting times where there's there's lots of programming. Do languages. I do closure? Do I yeah, do closure? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Do I do Rust? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's right. there's a and there. Trying to satisfy a similar niche, right? And so, how do you decide? And and you know, it's critically important for programmers because programming languages are, of course, our our key tool, mm -hmm. and they're also incredibly expensive tools. It takes six months, a year to become really proficient in even like a straightforward <laughs> programming language like Ruby, let alone something maybe more complicated like C++, right. you know, back in the day, or maybe Scala, people say, is fairly complicated. So if you think of, you know, six months worth of work is maybe a thousand hours, right? right? That is an unbelievably high cost. And that's just to become proficient. proficient. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Much less mastery. Right. And so the talk is all about, um, you know, which programming languages should you keep an eye on and not which in terms of like specific languages, but it's kind of a, a meta talk about, you know, what, how, how can you select a new programming language and say that is one I'm going to keep my eye right. on, you know, that kind of thing. Um, well, well it's, it's a very interesting, because I also went through that myself when I went from C Sharp. I, you know, when I went from Visual Basic to C Sharp, right. it was a no-brainer. Yep. It was, I'm getting off of this. Right. And, you know, the choices were VB.net or, or C Sharp, right. and it was C Sharp. Uh, but then after a few years, it, I, I went through that period where, okay, I'm ready to move on to do something else. It was getting a little... Yeah. Well, it, For it's, me. It's, it's, yeah. uh, the reason I call it interesting times is it's, it's one of those best of times, worst of times things. You, you get to the point where you're like, okay, well, there's other options, and I need to stop doing what I'm doing, and that's great, like you're ready to move on, but then there's the frightening thing of, yeah. I need to move on and I need to get this right, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, and with, fortunately with Ruby, it already had Ruby on Rails, and that was pretty established, so it was a safe-ish jump. Well, it was, um, if you were talking about 2004, I sort of started with <laughs> Ruby years before yeah. that. I was a few years yeah. after 2004. Yeah, there you go, so, yeah. So yeah, it was pretty safe, but yeah. You know, now it's not so safe. It's probably more like when you were pre two thousand four. Right. Right. Um, so yeah. So I think I think as I say, the, the the really major programming languages are are going through some kind of flux, and we're seeing all these new ones. I mean, Clojure is the one that I've picked up most recently, and the one you know, kind of my new programming language. But you know, for different people in different circumstances, it could be different. Right. And the other thing that's happening is we, I think, are going through the same kind of thing that people went through in the 1980s when object-oriented programming came along. Well, now it's functional programming seems to be the the new. Well, if you ask me, is the new yeah. new way of looking at the world, and. That's, that involves a lot more than just learning a new programming language. It's yeah. kind of retooling the way you think about things. The whole paradigm is different. Yeah. It isn't yeah. simply, right. well, how do you do an object right. in this language? How yeah. do you getters and setters right. and create instance methods? And no, it's like, no, forget all of that. Right. <laughs> yes. yes. How do you handle state? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, you know uh, just a few years ago, sort of multi threaded programming was something exotic that mm -hmm. not so many people did. And now, making concurrency work, which is not quite the same thing, but making concurrency work seems to be the thing that we need to master in the re really short term to get you know, the modern world back working again. You know, when light bulbs have an IP address, <laughs> concurrent programming is really important. Right. And well, just one more variable into that decision is, again, when I was going from C Sharp to Ruby, it was also because of some dissatisfaction with a corporately owned um, driven right. uh, language and platform versus open source. And I looked at open source as being 
okay, that's not necessarily tied to a marketing cycle. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> when you're when you're looking at these languages, are you factoring those kinds of decisions in? So what I think is, what, what I say in the talk is basically this, that I can't tell you what your next programming right. language can be, but I can tell you, and, and I think that what people tend to do is they tend to fasten onto a language. They hear a talk about Scala or Elixir, or, you know, name the, the programming language closure, and they fasten onto that language. And what you should really be doing is backing up and saying, well, you know, open source versus closed source is important to me. Functional is important to me. Um, how will, you know, I want to, I want a programming language that does concurrency with communicating sequential processes. I don't know. And then go find a programming language that does that. I think you win doing that. That's how I found Ruby. I, I wanted a simple, uh, dynamically typed, object-oriented programming language. Okay? I say that, and you just, today, you know, in this era, you think, okay, well, that would be Ruby. It would be, you know, one of a small number. But I found Ruby by saying, what did I want in a programming language? And working from there, instead of like looking at the menu of programming languages and saying, "Oh, that's a cool one," right? You know. And actually, I'm going to just ask you to stop right there for a moment. So, when you you were talking about Ruby, and and uh, obviously with Ruby, you've you've approached a level of mastery. You put a lot of effort into it, a lot more than six months. Uh, looking at these languages, have, have you been able to develop a strategy when you start to to look at these languages or pick a language to? maybe expedite that, that effort to get to not just proficient, but eloquent? So, so the, way, the way Eloquent Ruby came about was I was teaching lots of mostly Java programs, mm -hmm. the program in Ruby, and they were all making exactly the same mistakes over and over. It's sort of the, you know, the, the obvious things that you might do if you came from some particular programming language to a different programming language. And I started making a running list of, you know what, don't do this. You're gonna you're gonna want to do this, but do this instead. Mm -hmm. And I realized no one else was writing that stuff down. There was no one place you could go to and say, oh, this is how the natives really do it. Right. So let's let's just kind of accelerate that process along and get you up to that point. So I think for any programming language, there is the, the sort of just basic proficiency level of you know I can I know how to do decisions and and iterations or whatever in the programming language. You get to that point, and then your very next step, before you really write anything significant, is go start looking at how the natives are speaking right. this language. Go look, if you want to write, I don't know, some simple application, I don't know, you know, like a classic blog right. uh, web app, don't just sort of sit down and write your version of it, because you're almost certainly going to go off in the wrong direction. What you should do is you should peek at someone else's version and say, oh, okay, that's the general outline. Go back and then try it. And then when you have something, go back and peek again so that yeah. you're, you know, you're playing off of how do the natives speak it with practicing yourself. And, and actually, uh, that is, I mean, kind of in line with what DHH was talking about with reading, reading and writing code. So that way yeah. you can learn to write by reading. Yeah. And that you read these, these, these uh, works and then you're, build a better vocabulary, a better understanding of, of sentence structure. Right. I, I mean, uh, if you learn French, you do not learn French by learning French grammar and then start making up sentences. Right. You learn French partially by that, but also partially by reading either simple or more complicated bits of French literature and talking to actual French people. Right. That's how you learn French, and I think the, the analogy is really pretty strong. Because um, you can actually, um, I think, learn to uh, program in a, in a new programming language and actually be quite capable of it and be speaking a dialect that no one else knows, which is almost as bad because then you're, you're, you know, you kind of fork the community at that point. But when you first start though, I, I've run into people have that exact question that is coming from one platform um, and one, you know, I use CamelCase or I use yes. PascalCase yes. and then they come in uh, like these, the under the snake case is weird. Yeah. So they, you yeah, know, they write, what to me now, after several years right. of writing Ruby, it's kind of ugly, but it's part of the learning process. It, it really, you know, it's funny, um, for exactly that reason, I recently came across one of the very first programs I've written in Ruby. Right. Like, it was buried in a, 
you know, the, the C drive directory that had been in a larger, you know, the D drive yeah. directory, you know, kind of the archaeological. Archive, archive, yeah, yeah, yeah. archives. Yeah, and it was buried. And I found it. I actually put it out on GitHub. But yeah. it's actually a GitHub project. Of, it's not really my first Ruby program, but it's pretty close. Yeah. And it has all of that stuff in it because I, I had been a Java programmer, so it looks yeah. like Java and Ruby. And I think it's, I, I would encourage everyone, if you can find your early yeah. Ruby, to put it out there, to say, to show people mostly. You know, this is how I did it too. Everyone goes through that process. But I think, so one of the things I talk about in the talk today is how um, if you're learning a new programming language, like you start out and you're all excited, I'm going to learn this new programming language, the iceberg in your way is the syntax of that new programming language. Because we, once you're a programmer, I think it's absolutely unavoidable, you look at the syntax of a new programming language, and it's like a punch in the stomach, right? right? There is this emotional, visceral reaction that's sort of like, that is evil, right? right? Intellectually, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just a different notation. But but in your gut, you know it's bad. Every time I try to look at closure, right? Yes. yes. Especially by somebody who is very good at writing closure. Yeah. They write terse, tight, functional code, and, it's, right. and it uses all the constructs that are you know, that you have to have a deep mastery of it. And that is, that's the one thing that, you know, looking at these functional languages, if you come from a very, I almost think of like uh, C-sharp and VB and Ruby um, and Java as being kind of plain spoken languages. Uh, they're they're uh, a working dialect uh, where you come into, um, so you, you, you go from <laughs> a very simple dialect that's, that's very, very obvious to something that, it's a lot of nuance and shortcuts and but, but Ruby has all kinds of nuances. I mean I think all of the programming languages have all kinds of nuances. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the kind of thing, you know, people who learn like new human, you know, French or whatever programming languages, they talk about the moment where they start dreaming in that right. in that uh, language and that's the moment. And so I, I, it's I, into the yeah, I, and I know what you're talking about with closure because I went through that. I picked up closure and put it down like three times. So right. I sort of went through what you're talking about approximately three times. But around the fourth time, and it was me like running out of time and not being able to devote the time to it. Around you know, around the fourth time, uh, and again, it was just me you know putting in some time and actually getting to that point. All of that stuff made sense. And so when I when, when you say that it's it's uh, not really plain spoken. I can feel what you're right. saying, but I don't feel that way anymore. Y yeah, you know, so, it, it's, so it, it, I'm reflecting an earlier yeah. moment for you where yeah. it's, mm, that's, yeah, that's yeah. And, it, and you're right, it is a process. It's a real process of, uh, you know, you, initially you have to go through the, the sort of nausea over the syntax for any programming language, right? The new syntax just makes you a little crazy. And then you have to go through the, you know, maybe the conventions and things like that, and that makes you a different kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you really get what these people are talking about. You know, there there are no stupid people programming. Right? Yeah. So every single I mean, programming I mean, uh, language has, despite what we may yes, say, sometimes. yes, <laughs> we, we say that you know tongue in cheek. But if you think about, you know, all the thought that goes into even a not very well known programming language, those are really towering intellectual achievements. Right. There are no stupid, well, like, there are no stupid programming languages that you've heard of. <laughs> put it that way, you know? Right. You really have to respect them and, you know, learn to program the way they're meant to be programmed. You get to the eloquent phase. Right. And, you know, just to, to pivot and look, you know, you, you haven't written a book, are, are you still actively in the authoring world? Or? I, um, so I've actually written two books. Oh, okay. I've written Design I Patterns in Ruby uh, before. Oh, okay. I like Ruby. Um, I am always writing. I, I, you know, for me, writing the books was like somebody coming along and saying, "Hey, we'll pay you for this thing you're already doing. <laughs> Wonderful." Right. Okay. And I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, pay me for this. Um, and. So yes, I'm always, I, I've had this sort of book project simmering in the back of my mind that I, I work on and then I leave and I come back to and it's you know a matter of how many hours are in the day, but it's all about explaining technical things. I think, it, I think uh, uh, we as programmers, as technical people, we have 
so much to explain to each other, right? Our, the, the things we work with are really complicated. We have all these programming languages and all that other stuff that we're dealing with. And we really need to be like expert explainers. Right. And by and large, we are not. And, so, and, and so I think by we're writing, gonna, you help yes. with learning how to explain. Or well, thinking about explaining. So, so I have this book project, which is about how to explain things. Okay. Okay. Because I think I think we may I, again. It's like the, the the new programmer coming to a different language. There's a series of mistakes that people make when they try and explain things. Right. And um, you know, take a silly example. People tend to use really complicated examples when they try and explain things, and the example tends to overwhelm the thing that they're trying to explain. Right. So. I really believe, if you look at my books, the examples tend to be painfully simple because I don't want the example, you know, the subject matter of the example to detract from what I'm trying to say. I just want just enough of an example to, to motivate the thing. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I've, I've experienced exactly what you're describing. Uh, I'm trying to do something that might be simple to somebody and where else wanted to do this kind of a obscure. Uh, Sending uh, parameters through a has been a relationship yeah. right, using the new syntax in Rails 4, which you know, changes how things work a little bit. And I find lots of people had written about how they had basically approached the problem, but they had their own kind of domain things yes. mixed in there. And then you're trying to understand, like, okay, I got these four objects, and then I got to know how, okay, that the, the user was the, th okay, and then the user went into the operation, and then the operation had. You know, inventory and the inventory had many. It's like okay, like so, like even the the cognitive overhead right, from right. just the domain that they chose right. to to describe the problem is already complex enough. Much less yes. the thing that they were trying to yes. describe. So, so, for example, in design patterns in Ruby, I think I don't know. There's 18 chapters in that book or something, and there's 18 different examples. Mm -hmm. And it's when I went to write Eloquent Ruby. I thought that, you know, and I tried to make those 18 examples as simple as I possibly could. And when I went to write Eloquent Ruby, it came to me, and it's one long example. There, there is basically one class in that book and variations of that class all the way through from beginning to end. And yes, you're sick of those documents at the end of Eloquent Ruby, but at least you didn't have to relearn, you know, the yeah. example. And then if you like, try to refer back, Mm -hmm. To understand, okay, right, they changed something in this second chapter. Well, it's now a totally different thing. Right, and, and how does it relate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you can weigh them against yeah. each other and say, yeah. oh, okay, the obvious is, the difference is shine yeah. because there's a nice beige background. Yes. Uh, to, to allow the, yeah. the important things to emerge. So that's a good example of how you, you, know, you could either stay on the tracks, if you will, or get derailed. Trying to explain things, and I think there's a lot of things like that. And I think it's it would be worth writing a book that just sort of says, "Hey, you're a technical person. It's not you know the world of accounting or the whole world or anything. Something for us. Right. Here's how you explain, or here's some you know not really tricks, but techniques for explaining technical things that are kind of known in the work because I've you know spent 700 pages explaining technical right. things. Now, are you uh, publishing this through a publishing house, or are you? I haven't, really, I haven't really decided. Um, I've, I, historically, I, the two earlier books were, you know, sort of standard publishing, uh, and I haven't really decided which way I could go. Um, you know, sort of uh, old school publishing, maybe that's the word, has its advantages. They sort of take over everything, and you don't have to worry about it. That's the advantage. That's also the disadvantage. They take over yeah. everything, and you kind of don't have any, any control. Um, unless you do a lot of negotiations and things like that. Um, I haven't decided. I really okay. haven't. Yeah. But uh, have, you, have you seen a change in the relationship that publishing houses have because of ebooks and, and things in self publishing that might be? I think they're still catching up. I okay. really think they're still catching up. I think they're um, kind of old school businesses and they're still trying to catch up. Okay, so yeah. like all of us, trying to figure out. Right, right. How, how do I make this work? Like, they're in interesting times as well. Yes, yes. They're in. I think they're in more interesting times than we are. Right. Well, thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Sure.
User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way! Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.